Good afternoon, and welcome to Jackson Kelly's webinar, OSHA Trends to Watch For in 2014. Some administrative items before we get started. First and foremost, if you have questions throughout the presentation, Kristen will be glad to answer them. Um, you can submit a question if you look on, the, on your screen. The chat pane at the bottom right hand of your screen, just type in your question, and Kristen will be glad to uh, respond to it. Um, or if necessary, we can get back to you after the uh, webinar. Secondly, if you have any technical questions today during the webinar, uh, please send an email to marketing at jacksonkelly.com and we will take care of it for you. And finally, after the presentation, we'll send you a uh, web link to the recorded presentation as well as the PowerPoint. We'll also include a survey that we ask you to complete so we can make these presentations better and more help, uh, fruitful for you. Finally, all participants' phones have been muted, and the presentation is being recorded, and we thank you all for attending. With that, I'll turn it over to Kristen White. Kristen is, has uh, focused her practice on occupational safety and health and regularly represents companies in all levels of regulatory compliance, uh, including matters from PSM and training to trenching and electrical. And with that, Kristen? Okay, thanks, Mary. Uh, good afternoon. Thanks for joining me today. Uh, like Mary said, if you have any questions, just type them in the pane um, in the little chat box as we go along, and I'll try to um, look over. It's on. I have it on my screen along with the PowerPoint, and we'll try to pick up the questions as we go along. So um, what we're going to talk about here for the hour is what we've called OSHA trends to watch for in 2014. And where these came from was about a week and a half ago at the American Bar Association meeting for the OSHA practice group. Um, the assistant, Deputy Assistant Secretaries of Labor, Jordan Barab and Dorothy Daugherty were both there, along with Tom Galaski, who's the Director of Enforcement. And all three of them were speaking to the group at different times and stressed different um, enforcement initiatives and focuses of the agency for this year. So that was one reason we wanted to put this webinar um, after that conference so you'd have the benefit of you know, what the agency is saying they're focused on for the remaining um, 2014. So that's what we're going to talk about today. So I'll try to pick up questions as we go so we can always flip in between different topics. So the first is to no, probably no surprise to anyone um, is OSHA's proposed rule on silica exposure. Um, the hearings are currently taking place as we speak. And from what um, has been reported, the hearings are being are quite heated a lot of debate on both sides. Um, so I think you know we're gonna you know we may see more after these hearings come out. But the proposed rule on occupational exposure to respirable silica um, has all the traditional elements of a comprehensive health standard. It you know, covers your dust monitoring, testing, medical surveillance, methods of compliance, job exposure, disease, economic impact. Um, you know, it has all your traditional elements. What's been most controversial about the rule is the new PEL, or permissible exposure limit, that it wants to put in place. And as you can see here, and as many of you may know, is you know, being proposed to lower it to the 50 micrograms of silica per cubic meter of air. Uh, this is a, uh, cutting the limit in half for general industry and an even more drastic um, reduction for the construction industry. Part of the rule also contains an action level. And so under the action level, if the um, exposure to silica hits 25 micrograms, then that's going to trigger an employer's monitoring requirements. So that's partly what I think is also controversial about this rule is, you know, if you come in, you know, up to half of what the PEL is, you're now at your action level. And so employers have to provide the monitoring plan that's going to take into account the nature of their entire workforce. And this, drug, this coverage gets triggered if there's any amount of detectable silica in your workplace, um, if, if it hits this action level. Now, one part of the rule, um, when this rule was being written and proposed, OSHA had not initially considered the effect it was going to have on hydraulic fracturing. And uh, I think this is another big part of the hearings this week, is that the rule explicitly covers hydraulic fracking in the oil and gas industry and recognizes that coverage there presents some unique challenges because of the exposure over a large area. However, the effect to hydraulic fracturing was not um, considered when this rule was being written as far as some of the economic impact. 
One um, method that OSHA is proposing the oil and gas industry consider is a written access control plan. And this has to take into account um, the areas where employees are going to be exposed or are reasonably expected to be exposed above the PEL. And this, re and it, this requires certain training, uh, demarcation of areas, and it applies to all employees that are going to be at that work site. So even if they work for another employer, such as a subcontractor, um, they'd have to be included as part of this um, control plan. Another part of this rule that's very interesting is that um, personal respirators are not considered dust control. So what OSHA is focusing on is that an employer has to be able to show that they've exhausted administrative controls and engineering controls in order to bring down the respirable levels of silica below the PEL before they can put employ employees in respirators. And that's going to be, you know, have to be documented and shown um, before they can before they can resort to respirators. If there's a contamination of clothing, if that's a possibility, then the plan also has to take into account the means for um, removal of the contaminated dust. Uh, the last part of this rule I want to highlight for you is the medical surveillance. Um, if actual or expected exposure um, is, a, is expected to occur at or above the PEL for 30 or more days, then medical surveillance is now required. And the initial evaluation has to be completed within 30 days of the employee being assigned, and then the employee has to be followed for these follow-up evaluations every three years. Um, but like I said, this kicks in if there is actual or expected exposures above the PEL for 30 or more days. So we'll wait to see what happens. OSHA um, last, or at the conference a week and a half ago, they were not willing to give a timetable for um, the proposal of the final rule. Um, I think they, were, they wanted to get through the hearings that are currently being held um, and then regroup after that. So um, some people have predicted maybe later this year, maybe next spring, but OSHA is not willing to give us a timetable on the final rule. So I think it, you know, well, it's kind of a wait and see as to what happens after these hearings. Injury and illness reporting requirements. Um, this is an area where OSHA has been proposing what I'd call kind of new and interesting <laughs> requirements for employers. The most recent proposal that OSHA has proposed would require the electronic filing of information of workplace injuries and illnesses by employers. And what the proposed rule um, states is that employers who have 250 or more workers so that includes full-time, part-time, temporary, um, during their peak employment, would have to submit to OSHA every quarter their OSHA 300 logs and also their OSHA 301 incident reports. Now, for employers with just 20 or more employees in certain industries, they would have to submit their 300A annual summaries to OSHA. Now, the controversial part of this rule isn't so much the submitting of the information to OSHA, but that OSHA intends to make the information publicly available on their website. And one issue that was discussed um, at the conference in quite detail was how would OSHA protect the private information, especially if you're submitting your 301 incident reports, which contain employees' names. And OSHA's statement so far is they're unsure how they would scrub um, being the word they're using, the private information, but they realize they would have to do it, but they don't have a plan in place for exactly how that would occur. They just want employers to know that they do plan to scrub private information. Um, like I said, that has been more of the controversial aspect of this rule than the submitting of the information, um, especially with OSHA not giving the details of how they're going to protect the information. Um, OSHA's view on this rule is that um, it will allow employers to better identify and eliminate hazards uh, because they'll be able to see where other employers in their industry are having trouble. Um, the, a lot of the industry representatives at the meeting feel that it's part of OSHA's shaming um, tactic that they've used in recent years where they put out press releases um, that, that kind of goes along the lines of that of just kind of more public shaming for people who have injuries. So the comment period on this um, recently closed. 
again, they're giving no timetable for a final rule, but um, it remains to be seen if they, if they continue forward with this rule, but it is a priority for the agency. Um, you may remember OSHA had proposed previously, and we haven't seen it go, any, go anywhere yet, but OSHA had re, um, proposed that to, a change to the injury and illness reporting, which would require employers to report all workplace fatalities, which you do now, but also all work-related inpatient hospitalizations and all work-related amputations. As many of you know, currently um, you have to report what I call the fat cat, a fatality or a catastrophe, which is defined as the inpatient hospitalization of three or more employees. So OSHA um, had proposed to broaden the reporting um, for even one employee inpatient hospitalization and amputations. But um, while this remains a priority, as they're saying, we haven't uh, seen what the next step is going to be yet. Along these same lines is OSHA's proposed injury and illness prevention program. Uh, many of you probably know Dr. Michaels has said that this has been his number one priority since he came to the agency. Um, however, it's taken a bit of a back seat right now uh, to the silica rule and some of the other injury and illness reporting changes we just talked about. But the proposed rule um, or the idea that OSHA has would require employers to identify and fix hazards. Um, what most employers are concerned about is that they'd be getting cited twice for the same hazard. For example, you'd be cited for the, the hazard that the inspector found and also for the fact that you didn't find it as part of your injury and illness prevention program. But what OSHA, you know, looks at for these programs and what they're, they're talking about wanting is, you know, an employer to establish some clear safety and health go goals for the program a designated individual to have responsibility to maintain the program and ensure sufficient, re sufficient resources are given um, for the program implementation. Another key aspect um, for this proposal is worker participation, um, ensuring that the workers at the sites are involved in developing the program, they're included in, these, in the workplace inspections and investigations, and that employees are being encouraged to report um, any concerns, hazards, injuries, even near misses, and that any employee who participates in the program is protected. So these are some of the elements that if we see I2P2 move forward at some time, uh, we think that it, it will contain. The agency, you know, remains steadfast that this is a priority of theirs. Um, however, I, I don't look to see any movement on it this year based on everything else on their agenda. Um, next, temporary worker safety. OSHA just put out a memo about a week, week and a half ago that um, gave some more information on their temporary worker initiative. This was something they talked about um, that Dorothy Daugherty and Tom Glassy talked at the conference in quite detail about. This is quite the focus for the agency right now. And part of it is, is OSHA believes that um, temporary workers are not being trained and protected from hazards the same as, you know, your full-time employees. So their goals as part of this initiative is to protect your temporary workers from workplace hazards, ensure that the host employer, meaning the place where the temporary worker has gone to work, that that host employer understands the safety and health obligations, make sure that the temporary worker learns information about what hazards are in the workplace and that the host employer treats temporary workers like any other worker in their facility in terms of training and safety and health protections. The memo that came out recently, and I think that we issued a news alert on last week, um, talks about and clarifies, I think a lot of host employers do this already, but it clarifies and puts in writing that, ho that the agency expects host employers to record injury and illnesses of temporary employees on the host employer's OSHA log if the host employer is supervising that employee. Um, I think many employers have been doing that if they're supervising that temporary employee, but OSHA put it out there in a memo um, that that's the expectation, that host employers are recording the injury and illnesses of the temporary workers. Um, Part of this initiative as well is that OSHA is expanding its enforcement efforts to try to protect temporary workers. Uh, there was a recent inspection in Atlanta where OSHA cited the host employer 
um, for a variety of violations relating to its temporary workers. So I think we're going to see this increased scrutiny from OSHA inspectors with regard to a temporary workforce. Um, as part of this initiative, OSHA has mandated that inspectors gather and track information related to temporary and contract workers during their inspection. So what we're seeing is that an OSHA inspector will interview temporary employees um, just as they do your full-time employees to determine have they been trained in hazards, um, you know, what type of training they've received to make sure they're being included with the rest of the workforce. Um, OSHA is interpreting temporary workers to encompass only those workers being supplied by a staffing agency. So it excludes your day laborers or your seasonal workers that are hired directly by a single employer and also through a contractor or subcontractor relationship. So this initiative uh, truly just applies to those employees who are being hired by a staffing agency, typically paid by a staffing agency, but being placed at your workforce and typically supervised um, by your foreman just as your employees do. We expect that during these inspections you're going to be asked to provide training records for these temporary workers. And as I mentioned, the inspectors are um, interviewing the temporary workers to determine if they've received training and they know what type of hazards they're encountering. Based on the initiatives and the memos that have come out, I would expect to see the fines from these inspections um, increasing um, based on the fact that OSHA's view will be employers should know about these obligations. Whistleblower focus. It's probably no surprise that uh, this remains a focus for the agency. OSHA recently started permitting um, online submission of complaints. And so, you know, and that directly to the goal of increasing whistleblower complaints and making it easier for people to report complaints. Um, during this conference, OSHA gave out some of their figures um, for uh, fiscal year 2013 and fiscal year 2014. And one that's worth noting is that the percentage of inspections that are resulting from a complaint for fiscal year 2014 has already exceeded those for fiscal year 2013. Um, so in short, you know, complaint inspections are on the rise. Um, for the entire 2013 fiscal year, 24% of the inspections were a result of complaints. And now just for this portion of fiscal year 2014, that percentage is up to 28%. This could average out over the next few months, but it um, appears that we are going to receive more inspections resulting from employee complaints. Uh, for whistleblower investigations, um, the number of cases each year has been rising steadily since 2006. Um, OSHA is responsible for enforcing, you know, 22 federal law whistleblower provisions. So this isn't just coming up under typical workplace safety, although that's where the vast majority are coming from. But as you can see, the whistleblower protection program reported. Um, 1,686 cases for 2013. We expect that number to increase for 2014. However, while we get a lot of complaints and a lot of investigations, um, the most recent numbers we have coming out of 2012, 78% of those complaints were either withdrawn or dismissed. Um, I think this is an interesting number, that OSHA is really increasing the amount of complaints they're getting, um, but the vast majority of those are not going anywhere. Um, for those that do progress, we're seeing a lot of signals that OSHA intends to pursue these claims more aggressively. Uh, we've seen recently OSHA filing the, you know, the complaints in district court and really moving a little quicker than they have in the past. Based on this, you know, the advice remains the same, that we have to take employee complaints seriously um, you know, and make sure that, that employee complaints are being investigated. I was, hold on, one moment, I was looking here, I got a question, so I was going to try to address that here. Is there a definition of supervised? Um, so looking here, I'm assuming this probably related back to, sorry, I just saw it <laughs> on the software. Um, that's a good question. I'm assuming that relates back to the temporary worker initiative of whether OSHA is defining supervised. And I was looking to see, 
was thinking about at the conference if they explored what that means. And I think it goes back to who is directing the employee's day-to-day -day activities. Okay, yes, it does relate to temporary worker initiative. Okay. So that goes back to who is directing the employee's day-to-day -day activities. So if your foreman or your frontline supervisor is the one that is directing their day-to-day -day activities, um, then you are, under OSHA's definition, supervising that employee. Um, if that employee is being directed in his task by a, the staffing agency, for example, if the staffing agency had their supervisors on site and they're giving them their work assignments and, and instructing them how to do it, um, then I think you'd have an argument that you're not, quote, supervising them. There's not going to be a bright line test on that, but it's really going to look at, you know, who's controlling um, the task, who's directing them in the task, who's directing the safety, who's providing the training. Um, it's going to be kind of, you know, the grouping of all those factors together. If you've got a follow-up or another question on that, please just let me know. Yep. Okay, great. So let's go to the general duty clause. Um, this is something that most employers see as OSHA's catch-all provision. If they don't have a specific provision at issue to cite you on, then they're going to catch you with the general duty clause. And just so that we're all on the same page, um, OSHA's general duty clause under Section 5A1 of the Act provides that employers are required to provide their employees with a place of employment that is free from recognizable hazards that are causing or likely to cause death or serious harm to employees. And what this typically has meant when it, re it gets to the court system is that an employer has a legal obligation to provide a workplace that's free from rec recognized hazards. That tends to be the, the buzz term. And a recognized hazard can be a hazard that either the employer or the industry recognizes as hazardous or that's likely to cause harm. So even if you as an employer have not recognized that this condition can cause harm, if it's out there in the industry, then OSHA will consider that a recognized hazard. You see that come up, for example, in the oil and gas industry where you may have a lot of industry standards that apply to certain operations. OSHA has no regulations that even come close to those standards. OSHA could take your industry standard, and if you're not complying with that, potentially cite you under the general duty clause. OSHA outlined uh, two specific areas that they intend to focus on with respect to the general duty clause this year, and the first was workplace violence. If an employer has experienced um, acts of workplace violence, becomes aware of threat, intimidation, or is on notice of a risk, then they fall into the category that now they've got to do something um, to try to prevent a workplace violence scenario. And this, this is a really hard one, I think, for employers because a lot of times this can involve domestic violence issues um, where you may not know that an employee is struggling with, you know, potentially, not work, sorry, domestic violence issue, or you may not know that an employee is struggling with a domestic violence issue at home. Um, but if you become aware of threats or intimidation, then that's where OSHA looks at it that you need to implement a workplace violence prevention program, have some type of administrative controls in place um, to handle the situation. So I, th I think that's a hard one. I think a lot of times there's no notice if this occurs, but um, OSHA looks at it as this is a recognized hazard that if you become aware of something, you have to put some controls in place to deal with it. The other um, focus for the agency is heat stress. And I believe OSHA, I think it was last year when they put out some uh, memorandums about, you know, dealing with heat and preparing for the heat. Um, they, they're focused on making sure employers educate their workers about the dangers of heat. Um, make sure that workers get acclimated to it, you know, gradually increasing the workload when they're working in heat, allowing more breaks so they can build up some tolerance. And OSHA is also looking at do employers have a plan in place and training in order to reduce heat exposure. Uh, we actually had a client last year who had a fatality um, that was determined to be um, heat related. And 
the employer was able to, um, there were no citations issued in that case. And I think it was primarily due to the fact that they had a heat exposure plan in place that talked about um, taking breaks, making sure the water bottles were always full. And they also had training that they provided to their employees, training the employees to recognize um, when they were getting overheated and some of the symptoms to watch for. And I think based on those two factors, um, they didn't receive a citation from that, from that fatality case. And so what OSHA is looking for is these, you know, preventative steps and worksite training and plans, making sure there's some type of engineering controls. Um, if there's not air conditioning or ventilation, can there be tents placed? Um, you know, what is the work practice? Were there rest cycles? Is there water available, clean drinking water? Um, you know, are workers being able to, you know, take breaks when they need to? Um, you know, are workers trained to watch for the symptoms of heat-related illnesses? So those are the factors that OSHA is looking for to see if you've done everything you could um, to try to prevent you know, a heat-related um, illness or, or fatality. Corporate-wide settlements. This is something that uh, comes into play typically once you have a citation that's been placed in contest. And the solicitor's office, which is the, you know, the agency that represents OSHA once they are in litigation with an employer, they see corporate-wide settlements as a tool that they can use to help employers or sorry, excuse me, to help OSHA um, implement um, and protect future injuries. And the way it arises is that when the solicitor's office files a complaint in one of your cases, they will plead other appropriate relief. That's the language they use from the OSHA Act um, that they rely on, that they can, can try to implement corporate-wide, or you may have heard it called enterprise-wide uh, settlements. And what it's used for is to address perceived corporate-wide hazards. One of the most um, publicized cases where it was used came up with the Postal Service, where OSHA had inspected a couple sites from the U.S. Postal Service and found electrical hazards. And based on information they gathered, they believed that these electrical hazards existed in all sites across the United States. So they wanted the Postal Service to enter into a settlement where they agreed to fix the electrical hazards in all of their facilities. Now, this usually comes up in settlement negotiations um, that, you know, as part of different concessions that an employer may want from the agency, the agency may want an employer to agree that these hazards will not exist in any of their facilities. Um, it's been questioned by one ALJ in um, the case of Delta Elevator um, whether there's actually the authority for a judge to adjudicate over alleged hazards for which there's no specific proof being offered. You know, they're finding it in one or two facilities. They want to put on evidence that all their facilities are run the same way. Therefore, we should assume this hazard exists everywhere. So this is something I raise because if you wind up in litigation with the agency, uh, you may be asked, you know, to correct hazards in all your facilities. And while that it sounds you know, on its face as a good idea. Obviously, if you have a hazard in one facility, you don't want it to have anywhere else. It's another issue to have a statement in a settlement agreement that's legally binding that these hazards will not exist in any of your facilities, especially depending on how many you may have across the nation. Um, because now um, you've essentially pleaded guilty that it does exist and we will fix it um, if there would be an incident in the future. So um, there's pros and cons of these corporate-wide settlements from both sides. It's just something to be aware of that this is a key part of OSHA's enforcement initiative. The solicitor's office sees it as a pretty big tool to use, um, and so I don't see it going any, anywhere anytime soon. Criminal prosecution. I want to skip to this slide here. This is what most people are familiar with. To obtain a conviction under Section 17E of the OSHA Act, Typically, what a prosecutor has to show is that an employer willfully violated a standard or regulation and that that violation caused the death of an employee. This is typically the scenario that most employers are aware of can give rise to criminal liability. But one issue that came out at the conference that I thought was interesting is that 
um, OSHA is referring all fatality cases and investigations in which there are three or more serious injuries to district attorney offices for possible state criminal prosecution. And this is the first time I had heard this. We'd heard a few years ago that OSHA was starting to refer all fatality cases for possible criminal review. And based on 17E of the OSHA Act, you know, I could see where that would make sense if you have a willful violation that causes a death. But what they're looking at here is, is that if something does not rise to criminal liability under the OSH Act, for example, this three or more serious injuries, is there a state law that um, the employer potentially violated? And the examples they gave were uh, manslaughter or negligent homicide. Um, I'm not a criminal lawyer, um, a, a state criminal lawyer, so um, I'm sure that those definitions vary depending on jurisdictions. Uh, but I thought this was interesting that, you know, they're going to make these referrals to see if, you know, there could possibly be more criminal prosecutions under state law, even if they can't get it under the OSH Act. It's just something to be aware of that the agency is now doing. Um, this, just let, this is just the definition of employer, so you understand kind of under the OSH Act um, who, who is at risk. Um, when they're interpreting who an employer is for criminal liability, and that includes corporate officials and managers who exercise sufficient control over operations are deemed to be employers. Uh, courts have refused to permit the prosecution of supervisory employees, such as your lead people, um, who don't have sufficient control. So it really is those who are in control of the work site and typically in control of safety. Part of the criminal prosecution is that um, ignorance of the standard is not a defense where intentional disregard or plain indifference can be shown. Um, for example, you know, if a company intentionally fails to make its supervisors on job site aware of regulations, it can't plead ignorance. Um, it's a fine line. Typically for OSHA to pursue criminal violations, you see intentional conduct. Um, but they're, the agency is highlighting that it doesn't always have to rise to that if they can show an intentional disregard. So an intentional, you know, putting, of the, you know, putting your head in the sand um, can also rise to that level. Um, they look at, you know, if, if failing to make your supervisors on the job site aware of regulations, that that conduct can show plain indifference to the requirements of the law. Um, indifference to general safety or to a specific hazard can also be evidence of intentional disregard or plain indifference to the requirements of the law. I, I put these on here, and good, we have time, so I wanted to just quickly touch on a couple other issues um, that came up and that were discussed um, at the conference. They weren't discussed in quite as detail, but if we, since we have time, I wanted to see if we could talk about them. Um, updating of the PELs. Um, many of you may be aware OSHA recently had put out um, a memo regarding recommended exposure levels based on information from NIOSH. There's still a push in the agency that they want to update the official PELs um, in their rules, whether this gets done. I mean, you know, they're having so much trouble just with the silica rule, I'm not sure that they will get a full-scale updating of the PEL. But one issue that's been raised is that after OSHA put out the memorandum on the recommended exposure levels, whether they would be able to use the general duty clause to say, well, we're now aware that um, there should be protection at different levels, and therefore you violate general duty clause. Um, OSHA is saying that you know, the regulations are the regulations and that's what has to be complied with. However, there has been one case where the general duty clause was used to cite an employer um, for not complying with a recommended PEL. When they were asked about this case, OSHA you know, states, well, this case was very fact specific um, and that they don't intend to generally do that. But I, I think that remains to be seen a little bit. Um, based on these recommended levels. I do think that legally in front of an ALJ they would have trouble um, asking you know, a judge to, to uphold a violation based on a recommended PEL when they, when they have regulations that are on the books. 
The second one here, walk around rights. There was the, the memo that's been called the Fairfax memo that came out, um, which basically stated that a union representative could be designated by employees as their walk around um, designee on a non-union site. And this caused a lot of um, heartache and because the OSH Act states that a, the walk around employee designee shall be an employee. However, OSHA points to the fact that the next sentence talks about that if a third party is reasonably necessary to an inspection, then they can be included. So um, we haven't seen a lot of litigation over this issue yet, um, but I think it's something to be aware of that for, for non-union sites, I think what most employers are worried about is that you know they're now you know letting in potentially a union representative or a union organizer um, as part of a walk around under this language based on the Fairfax memo. Um, one issue that was discussed is that you know an employer could take the stand that they're not letting in that um, the union representative as the walk around and OSHA would have to seek a warrant in district court in order to bring that person in as the representative. We haven't seen it go that far yet. Um, from what I've heard that, you know, this has only been used a couple times for the union person um, to come in as a designee. Um, that person would have to be designated ahead of time by the employees. You know, and typically that's going to have to be done with a document showing that that union representative is the employee representative. Um, you know, but it's an interesting issue that I think, you know, remains out there. Um, increased enforcement, I think that's kind of been the overarching theme of, of today is a lot of these different enforcement initiatives, um, what OSHA is continuing to push with the general duty clause, the whistleblower complaints, you know, that the enforcement and not compliance uh, remains their, their focus. Uh, the last thing I want to mention is just the PSM changes. Um, OSHA's put out a request for information on the process safety management rule. Many believe that OSHA is going to try to eliminate the atmospheric storage tank exemption um, for flammable liquids that are connected to a PSM covered process. Um, they, that's at least being discussed that they are reevaluating that exemption um, for the above ground atmosphere storage tank. So, if they're reevaluating it, many believe they may try to eliminate it. The other PSM change, um, for those of you who have to deal with PSM, is the management of change. Many believe that OSHA will look to expand what management of change applies to. So expanding MOC coverage to changes in your facility organization, staffing, policies, and whatnot. So um, those are a couple of the issues that are being discussed that could potentially be um, changes to the process safety management standard, which, you know, is, if you have to comply with that now, you know, is already um, a pretty taxing standard. Um, but those are some of the changes that they're looking at. So that's everything that I had um, to discuss with you today. Um, you know, tried to put together a list of what we see from, what we're hearing from the agency, what we see. Um, you know, occurring in industry, and just to give you an update of, of what to be aware of and what to watch for this year. Um, so, um, I'm never a bad thing to end a little early, so if you have any questions, feel free to send them in, um, but thank you for participating today. Great. Thank you, Kristen. Um, as Kristen mentioned, if you have any questions, you feel free to either contact her directly or type them in now. But if not, to contact Kristen directly. As you may know from the time we started today, she is located in our Denver office. But the firm Safety and Health Group has folks in all of our offices and really works across the nation on these issues. So again, thank you for your time. We will follow up with a recording and the PowerPoint presentation that Kristen's provided and look forward to speaking with you all soon. Thank you. <laughs>